My name's Tamara Bigay, and I am with Indigenous Design Studio Plus Architecture. Um, we, well, I started IDSA about 12 years ago, um, really focusing on working with um, Native American communities, Indigenous communities in terms of like design, planning, and all sorts of fun things. Um, and I originally um, um, grew up in a community right outside of Galp, New Mexico called Ayambato. Um, and then um, ventured out to towards Albuquerque and um, really enjoy the work that we do. Um, I think it's important. Um, um, and, and I think it's something that has always been dear to my heart to um, work with communities and really design, plan, um, and, and it could be as small as, you know, uh, an addition to a building and as large as a school. So I'll go ahead and pass it on to Jan. Hi, Antonio. Antonia, nice to meet you. <laughs> um, I'm going to say Antonio. Um, I know a few of those. Um, my name's Jan. Um, I'm from Michigan, born and raised in Michigan, but my parents were from, my mom was from um, Wasuxing, and it's an island in uh, Lake Huron, Georgian Bay. Um, and my dad is from um, Ganoage, Quebec. Um, he's Mohawk and a uh, known um, skywalker or ironworker. All my uncles and cousins and grandfathers uh, were all um, iron workers. Um, so we spent a lot of time on the reservation in the summers because the winters are harsh where they're from. So we rarely traveled in the winter um, up that way. But um, I've been with IDSA for over 10 years now. It's hard to believe, Tamara, it's been that mm -hmm. long. <laughs> so much has changed. Um, from Tamara and I sitting in an office with a couple part-time people, not enough chairs for a meeting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but it's changed a lot, and it's been exciting to watch IDSA grow over the past 10 years. Um, we're in the biggest, our biggest office yet, and we still need some more room to sit people. So... <laughs> It's been a lot of fun, at times stressful. Um, Native communities need so much help in the planning area. Um, and we have to educate them about our processes and how much things really cost. It's not $99 a square foot, <laughs> uh, but it's been fun. And I'll pass it on to Amanda. Jan, real quick, what is your last name? Tifria, T-I-F-R-E-A. Hi, everyone. Good morning to all of you. My name is Amanda Golden. I am the managing principal of Designing Local. We are a cultural planning firm based in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, we started our firm in 2014, and we are a bunch of planners and urban designers and landscape architects. And at the center of our mission as uh, a company is to really design with arts and culture at the center of all the things that we're doing. And so that takes us all over the country and um, has landed us this Reimagining Columbus project. And uh, I got to know Tamara by interviewing a ton of different, really four different organizations that we could potentially have worked with and met Tamara and within like two minutes was like, I got to know her and I want to be her friend, but also <laughs> to work together. So I'm excited to be here today. And I'll pass it to Aaron. Great. Thanks, Amanda. Um, hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here and able to join today. Um, my name is Erin Blue. I work with the City of Columbus. I was actually hired um, to help facilitate this project specifically. My background is in um, fundraising and arts administration. And so I'm new to the city, but I've really enjoyed uh, getting to know Amanda and the entire team that's been pulled together for this project. And uh, we're excited to, um, to talk with you today. Well, thank you. Um, Aaron. I'll start with you. Uh, about four years ago, well, four years ago, the Columbus statue came down at City Hall, and then the Reimagining Columbus project came about, and part of it is to reckon with the city's namesake, Christopher Columbus. Can you talk a little bit about why that's important to the city? 
Well, the uh, so the the history uh, sh briefly about the statue, uh, 1955, it was a gift from our sister city uh, in Genoa, Italy, uh, to the city of Columbus, and it was at City Hall for you know all of, until 2020. Um, when we removed, when the city removed the statue in 2020 amidst protests and um, and all the demonstrations that were happening. Uh, we really felt it was a time to have a conversation that we hadn't had before. And actually some of that work started just internally, but then when the opportunity came to be part of the Mellon uh, family, if you will, of um, they have a really amazing program called the Monument, um, the Monuments Project. It's a $500 million investment in uh, conversations around uh, inclusion and representation in our commemorative spaces. And so the opportunity to be part of that community na nationally was really great. And as the largest city in Colum in the United States, maybe the world, named after Christopher Columbus, we felt this was an opportunity for us to dive into the complicated um, uh, reckoning with the namesake in a way that maybe other cities aren't, that we felt like we couldn't really avoid the elephant in the room, if you will. <laughs> and uh, Tamara, Part of the project is also amplifying stories of those who are, um, you know, marginalized, ignored, and also forgotten. That includes maybe the indigenous voice, as we know the history with Col Christopher Columbus. Um, as an indigenous person, um, you and Jan both, why is it important to be involved in this project? Uh, Tamara, why don't you start? Yeah, um, I think it's important because a lot of history and a lot of voices have been have been spoken that the indigenous community has been left out. And um, still today they are being left out about, you know, you know, the the whole story about Columbus coming over. Um, and, you know, we've had, we've changed holidays. You know, um, it's not Christopher Columbus here in New Mexico, it's Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, I think there's a voices, the voices are important because part of our design process is really listening um, to the stories um, we've heard things from the indigenous communities that, um, you know, we don't, they don't, they're not, they're, their voices are not taken seriously. And, um, and, and we hear that a lot. And so um, how do we respect these stories in a way that um, we can educate people, you know, about you know, numerous types of incidents during along that period? Um, you know, we can hear about, you know, the bad, we can hear about the good, but um, when it comes to commonality and it comes to, um, you know, having difficulties and how we can overcome difficulties, which is not, it's, it's, it's important in Native communities to understand that and how can we move forward, um, you know, um, thinking that, okay, this history was told from um, one point of view, um, but there's other voices out there that we can move forward with and how we can use that to design something and inspire people not to do the things that they have done in the past. Um, so that's why it's really important um, that, you know, the Indigenous communities are, are, are being heard, um, that we integrate that as part of the storytelling process. And Jan? Oh, uh, yeah, I think we had a meeting a a week ago at Amanda's office, um, which was a lot of fun working with a great group of people. Um, and we were talking about Columbus as he's not just a man anymore. He's become a symbol. And he and that symbol means different things to different people. Um, but especially for indigenous people, he's just a symbol of everything that was wrong with the the invaders to North America, to the Americas. Um, and to have our voices heard on it, because it seems like everybody does have an opinion. It's just getting it out there, getting, you know, talk to me and let me know what you think. Um, but I think this is an important conversation and the way we're documenting it, that which is, is a different process than um, a normal architectural process and listening to those stories and getting out there to the people in the communities. Um, that's the process that we use in all the indigenous communities that we work in and gather those stories to um, come up with some ideas, as Tamara said, inspire us 
um, to find find maybe a solution or some options for a solution. Uh, and it's a different process. It's a different way of thinking. And I think other communities can learn from this too. And Amanda, what are some of the stories and some of the things that you're hearing from the community there in Columbus, Ohio? We're hearing a lot of stories from different community members. I think some of the, the most interesting comments come when we ask people what cultural symbols should be placed in public space to represent their culture. And we're asking people those questions in different affinity groups. But I think what comes out is actually all the same things that represent connection to family, um, things that represent connection to food and breaking bread together, uh, things that represent joy. And all these different communities have different symbols of joy, but everyone wants to convey how joyous their communities are, how important their families are within those communities. Um, and I don't know that there's any one story or a few stories that stick out, but I think it's really kind of it's all the sameness that actually sticks out, which is not really what you would anticipate. You would think it would be the polarization, but it's actually uh, all the all the similarities. I don't know that those stories and the similarities would come out if you grouped everybody together, though. No. <laughs> Anything else to add, um, Aaron? I think, uh, you know, being able to, get together with community members for a lot of us are out of practice right over the last few years so um what's been really great that i've seen are especially when we're having people get together within their affinity groups i saw a lot of people that really just happy to be together again that hadn't been together in person to have a conversation about anything really in a long time and so uh you know, what we keep talking about is that the, you know, the statue is a convener of the conversation, but really it's about so much more than that. And that's been really evidenced in the, uh, the people that have, have come together to have conversation and build connection together. It's been really great. And it is taking a lot of people for this project. You have a lot of people on the team and also the advisory committee. Um, Tamara, can you talk a little bit about what is the project? What does it look like there was a, there's a timeline here from, you know, when it began to hopefully when it's expected to finish, what is the project? Yeah, well, I'll, um, I, I can actually pass that on to Amanda, you know, cause she's the one, she's the lead on the project. I'll have her talk a little bit about the process and where we're at and I can fill in on, 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 on the, the whole project. Sure. So uh, we wanted to approach this project really different than the city had approached any other project. And um, with the generosity of the Mellon Foundation, we were able to really think very broadly about how to do that. Um, so when we first started the project, we knew that we all had to be operating from kind of the same point of view. So the same statements that that were claimed as truth, right? Um, and I think in the beginning, we thought it was as simple as like, we're going to write a white paper about who Christopher Columbus is, and then that's going to be accepted as fact, and we're going to move on, and we're going to have this beautiful conversation, and everyone's going to be happy. Um, it actually took a lot longer to actually establish what those facts were. And even still today, people are continuing to kind of question like, what lens were you writing from when you're examining Christopher Columbus's role in the world's history? Um, and even using his own journal writings uh, as a first person account is oftentimes um, called into question as well. Uh, people even ask things like, well, don't you think he could have been faking what he was writing in his own journal to portray one kind of image to the crown who he was writing to? And we're like, why are you trying to justify something uh, and kind of twist history into being something that that it wasn't? Um, so when we when we built the project, we knew that education had to be a huge component of the project. Uh, we knew that there were a lot of different opinions about who Christopher Columbus was, how monuments about Christopher Columbus and of Christopher Columbus uh, came into our public space scene. Um, he is the third most commemor commemorated person in the United States in terms of monuments, which is like mind blowing because he's not American. Right. Uh, so uh, all of those things we felt needed to be uh, kind of examined. We also felt that there were a number of different narratives that intersected with the Christopher Columbus narrative. So 
what is the Italian immigrant story? Why is it important to the city of Columbus? Who were the indigenous people that were living in what is now central Ohio? And why do we not have any stories from them now? Uh, Ohio doesn't have any recognized tribes. And so how, how do we begin to kind of fill in the spaces where Christopher Columbus took up all the space uh, and a specific narrative took up all the space? Um, how did Christopher Columbus' ex existence impact uh, the Black community? And how did that then Im impact immigration patterns in the United States, but also in Columbus? And where were people kind of placed as our city grew and built? Uh, then how did the highways being built impact Black communities? And all of these things are coming from this colonial um, and colonization point of view. In addition to educating the public, we also knew that we had to uh, both um, nurture their minds and hearts, if you will. And so we had to provide an opportunity for people to really begin to think and use empathy in a way that they probably hadn't before. And so we brought in Kim Braswell of Chemistry, who built this beautiful engagement series. Um, she started very large and got small intentionally so. The very large meetings asked questions about epigenetic trauma. What are the traumas and the stories that we're bringing as people into meetings with others? And how can we understand and listen to those stories and then use them uh, to create empathy and use that empathy in building community? From there, she built um, this wonderful thing called a story lab where she had five credible storytellers, all from different backgrounds, an Italian-American, uh, a member of the Lakota tribe, uh, who is also a facilitator of engagement for this project, Shelly Corbin. Um, she had a an elder in the Black community, uh, a mother of a Mexi two Mexican children, uh, and then a young single white woman, uh, all from Columbus, and really coming together and telling their stories on stage for people to watch and to respond to. And um, ask really pointed questions about kind of their past and how, what they're bringing into conversations like this. And then finally, she finished with uh, very specific affinity group focus groups, which she called storyboarding sessions. Six questions were asked in each focus group. Uh, we had a Latino focus group, a college age focus group, a BIPOC focus group, an indigenous focus group, and um, uh, an Italian American focus group. And the same questions were asked and that data was then collected and then um, added to the other data that we've collected from other engagements and then handed to Tamara and her team to kind of take us into phase two, which I'll let her talk a little bit about. Yeah. So part of um, what we did in part of those engagements too was um, part of it is about education. And so we wanted to educate people that when we take on a project, that we take on more of this indigenous worldview in terms of, you know, design. And that's really that connection to um, connection to the earth, connection to the sky, connection to the two-legged beings, the four-legged beings, um, the connection to the seasons, the cardinal directions, um, the infants, the youth, the elderly, um, really this clockwise, you know, thinking aspect of it. Um, what it really tends goes back to this idea of, um, working to better, working together, you know, working together in, in a community um, aspect. So we did have that session and um, Jen had spoke, it's a different process. So a lot of the questions were like, well, what are you guys are going to do for the design? This is the part two, like um, in architecture and a design piece, people want to get right into let's design an object. We want to see something. And our process is coming up with the design, design principle. And we take all these stories, um, everyone's comments, and we bring that into this visual aid and this visual aid. And I always say when architecture school, we use it as more as like a party. And with that visual aid, um, we think about, again, community. We think about the voices uh, in a more like democratic, more maternalistic way. And um, we come up with this piece. And so a couple of weeks ago at um, Amanda's office out in Columbus, we presented that piece. We presented um, a design principle for each question that was posed to each of the um, affinity groups. And then we came up with the design principle. And I think um, when we presented it to the team, um, I think everyone was quite like, well, we need something visual. We want to see something like, what are you sketching on the site? We've done your site analysis. 
Um, but I think the group was kind of um, thrown back, like, wow, um, this is all what we've been speaking of. So we're going to take that design principle and we're going to use that and we're going to be able to start having conversations about site. We're going to about talk about maybe it, are we replacing the statue? Are we going to be removing it? Are we going to be replacing it somewhere else? Is it going to be a landscape focus? Is it going to be also a building? So we have three sites that we're going to use that design principle, but we need to go back to those stories because those stories are always being forgotten. And if we can stick to that, I think we will have a better design that really um, is going to make a voice for reimagining Columbus. And it's not like we're going to forget him. He's going to be there. Um, but it's going to be taking those pieces of the stories and designing it into, you know, a wonder landscape, wonderful landscape, a piece of art, a piece of building. Um, what if that's going to be? Is it going to be a museum? And I think we had conversations about, well, um, maybe the museum's the wrong word. Maybe it's something about a learning center. Um, so um, that is really the process. And, um, you know, Amanda and Aaron and all the whole team, you know, have to, has, they have, they're, 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 this is a new, new thing to grasp. But I think that they understand the importance of really going back to this indigenous worldview of like how we used to design back then. It wasn't like we had a, adhere to a schedule, a quick schedule, but it's taking into account all these factors. Um, again, going back to the connection to um, the land, um, connection to, you know, the ground, Mother Earth, the sky, um, you know, the cardinal directions, you know, the two-legged and the four-legged beings. So um, I, I think when people understand that process, if we were could use that same process and any type of building that we're building, even if it's in an urban area or rural area and on indigenous lands, I think we'll come up with projects that are more sincere, that are culturally appropriate, um, you know, that really for let, reflect the people, you know, the culture um, and the traditions and the language. Um, um, and I think that's what we used to design, um, you know, way back when, but we need to kind of reinforce that and bring that into like our, our fabric and our urban fabric and, you know, our real rural projects today. And um, just for clarification, so it could be a statue, a piece of artwork, landscape, or a, a, a building. A, okay. And, yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, Jan, uh, you're shaking your head, listening to Tamara talk. Anything you want to add to what she was saying? I think um, people want to want to jump ahead real fast and and ask, what is it? What kind of building is it? What's it going to look like? Um, and we're not there yet. Um, that'll come with as we work through all the inspiration that we've looked at. Um, um, just people, educating people on the process and how we get there to that point where we can show them something. Um, it, it's, it is a process. Um, I'm excited to see what, what it's going to be too. Um, but we're just, and I think there's a lot of ideas. We just have to massage those ideas into, uh, three cohesive options. There might be more, I mean, and, <laughs> but three, three is probably the best number for options. Uh, you give people too many options and they really have trouble deciding on what, what it should be. And um, Aaron, as we're talking about including all voices, um, there's definitely on this issue across the country, not just there in, in Columbus, but there's, I'm sure there's pushback. There's pushback on this issue. There's people who probably didn't want any kind of change at all. So how are those um, views being handled and incorporated in? Well, I think the, uh, the real uh, story is in the, the engagement we've done so far. You know, a lot of people came to those early meetings um, expecting kind of a town hall with a microphone and I'm going to stand up and I'm going to look to the front of the room and whoever's at the front of the room, I'm going to tell them what I think. Uh, and we uh, introduced, we welcomed them into the space. We said, by the way, we're not doing that here. And we're not actually going to talk about the statue, even though that's why I know you came. We're going to talk about you and your family and your stories, because those stories are part of Columbus, Ohio. And so, uh, you know, the, and that's frankly what is really exciting about the project. And 
it takes longer to do the work this way, right? It takes longer to make sure that we are reaching people that wouldn't maybe typically come to an event like that. And that's why we've had such a variety of events. We had family workshops, we've had nature walks to local indigenous sites um, to build um, that experience with our community members. And so we're building understanding and connection. And once people get that is the kind of the process is the point of the project. There's a different feel, there's different air in the room after that, right? So so that is really, again, the, the beauty of the project, the way it's been designed by Amanda and the team is really to uh, show that we want to hear those perspectives and uh, everyone matters equally in this conversation. Um, you know, at the end of this project, there will be recommendations made. They'll be brought back out to the community for further conversation. But, um, but really, it's, uh, it's a new way, like I said, and it takes a little bit longer to do it this way. A lot of folks who want to know, where are you going to put it? I've, I've got the, there's a corner, but this street and that street, and we could just stick it right there. I'm like, that's not what we're doing. <laughs> so, um, but that's been a really beautiful way to connect with the community as well. So it's, um, we're excited to be moving into the, the next phase. And I got a pop up saying we have about 10 minutes left on the meeting. So um, just okay. a couple more questions, uh, Amanda. So then what is next? And also, what are you seeking for um, from the public? Is there still, you know, when people hear or see this story, um, you know, what is wh how how is the engagement going and what's next in the project? Sure. So we just finished our last engagement event that has been scheduled. That was finished on Monday night. We had a um, conversation at a park around uh, a memorial to Chief Leatherlips, who was um, executed here in Central Ohio and the city within the city of Dublin. So um, that was our last planned event. However, you can still go on reimaginingcolumbus.com. And there's a survey that is live. There are six questions there. Folks can still contribute to that. We are still pulling that information and uh, all that information will be given to the designers to continue to build and solidify that design principle and continue to um, help support any of the design work that they are going to be doing. Uh, as we share, we are moving into that next phase that is starting, it started last two weeks ago. Uh, and we hope to be wrapped up by June. We're hoping for these at least some three concepts to be done later in the fall, winter, um, and hopefully we'll have some kind of more formal deliverable in the summer. Um, and there's also a place that you can just go on and fill out general comments on the website. You can check out all the educational material that has been created. There's lots of really wonderful content there for people to interact with uh, and engage with. And we would love more people to use that content for whatever they need to. And I guess um, this question for Tamara and Jan, but you know, it is it is important. You hear a lot about tribal consultation, um, not only having a seat at the table, but voice and listening to the community. But also, I think it's important to know also having Native women um, leading, and also as you know, business women and Tamara. There's, you know, I don't know a lot of people in in the field uh, that you are in, so maybe you can just talk a little mm -hmm. bit about the importance of that. Yeah, um, um, when I when I decided to um, start my own firm and become an um, an architect, um, I actually was part of a, a group that I started at UNM. It's called the American Indian Council of Architects and Engineers. Um, but there was also um, a, an organization, a professional organization, and Jan was actually part of that. And that's how I met Jan. And um, it was kind of like a group that I never knew when I was graduating school, I was trying to find a job and I worked for a non-native firm. And when 9-11 happened, they let all their interns go. And I went to an ACES conference and they, and I was representing AICAE and they said, Oh, um, you know, what does your organization do? I told them what we did. And they said, Oh, um, I know some native architects. So the first person that um, was on the list was David Sloan architects and kind of a first a full circle, he retired um, about a year ago and um, just bought his office. And so that's where we reside. Um, and I think right now it's important, um, you kind of you know spoke about um, women in architecture. There is about um, eight indigenous women that are registered architects um, you know, across the United States. 
um, there's not many of us. And so um, Jan is the first for own for her own tribe. I'm the first, um, you know, for my own. Um, so the first Navajo woman registered architect. So a lot of these women that are coming up, they're really first of their kind. Um, we don't really get the respect because I feel like in this industry, it's very male dominated and um, they don't take us serious. They think, oh, well, yeah, you are a native architect, but, you know, um, if you're a male, you know more, um, you're more educated. Um, and it goes down to the line of being also a businesswoman, too, that um, you see yourself as being a minority um, and a native woman and um, they don't take you serious enough. But. Um, you know, Jan and a lot of the people at IDSA is really about, you know, truly trying to work with and encourage um, other natives to be, um, you know, architects and going into that field because we need, we need, we need more. And coming from um, also a really a more maternal, um, holistic approach and design, I think is um, apparent in our world today. Um, I think we, um, can see the connectivity, you know, to all aspects of of life and and, and the world. Um, you know, I feel like we've been um, colonized in a way um, to think about buildings in terms of hierarchy, um, power, and greed. Um, in that maternalistic way of you know, indigenous women, we we don't think that way. It's all about that connection to the earth, Mother Earth. Um, you know, I would really try to, you know, educate people about that. And um, we're not very linear thinking. We think about um, all aspects of, of the voice. And um, I know that Indigenous uh, People's Month is coming up. And I think I would encourage people to really um, think about this project because this project has played a big role in um, our learning aspect. I remember in elementary school learning about um, Christopher Columbus, um, how um, he discovered America. And it's still, you know, being in my head that, oh, he discovered America. Not until um, learning, you know, about him and other voices and stories, I was like, well, in my own words, as, as a youngster was like, well, um, it was really about I feel like voyage, there was a voyage. It was really about immigration. It was a real about finding a better um, lifestyle for himself, his people. And if you think about that, it's kind of like what we're striving to get all together today. You know, we have um, this conversation about immigration. We have this conversation about family, um, you know, bettering our lives. And if we can take that story and and, and think of it in a different way and in, in a different light, um, you know, um, the input and, you know, what we can do, you know, with the story can empower um, you know, really the pipeline and the youth um, to think about, you know, let's not make these mistakes. Um, we have these histories. We, we even we going back to our, our an indigenous worldview and, um, you know, how we became here with um, our stories. There's a lot of um, um, stories about how we had to overcome things. Um, and it still plays today. And, you know, we need to listen to that, just listen to, um, Mother Earth and listening to like the beat of the drum of the earth and how we're going to do that in a way that is going to be responsible, you know, for, um, you know, continuing this path and how we're going to live and how we're going to make this place better um, when we leave this planet. So um, those are the things that I encourage people to think about, you know, the story. I mean, it has impacted a lot of people in a very positive and also not so positive way in, in history. Well, I want to thank you all. We have uh, about less than a minute left. Um, Jan, any uh, closing words just to close us out? Um, I think Tamara put that all in a nutshell for you. Um, she's really good at that. Um, but I, I just encourage communities to stick together. I think um, there are some communities that are really, really good at it. I think the Black community has been really, really good at getting together and getting things done for their, their communities. Um, uh, when you see the Natives in, or Indigenous people in, that live in urban areas, it's a little more challenging. Um, we had a hard time getting, getting any responses from them for this project. 
We had to go outside Columbus to do that. Um, and but there are there are indigenous communities out there that that are together. Like take Minneapolis, they're just getting a beautiful a renovation of their Indian Center. I was always very jealous of that because I was at the Detroit Indian Center, and we had a little church building that we bought. Um, at least we had a building, I guess, <laughs> to to have community events. But they have a beautiful place. And I was always really jealous of them having that beautiful place. And how could we do that in Detroit? Um, but they're, you know, just the community um, and encouraging them where we can. And we try to do that with all the um, the indigenous communities that we work with, too. Well, I want to thank you all. It says that our time's up, but thank you all for taking time out today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.